We're on page 248 in uh, Lectures in Systematic Theology by Thiessen. And we're down at the bottom of that page where it says the need of a tempter, the need of a tempter. My title of this message is Vehicles of Temptation, Vehicles of Temptation. The necessity of a tempter and vehicles of temptation. What's a vehicle? The way you get there. The way you get there. Okay, the way you get there, that's a vehicle. A mode of travel. Okay, a mode of travel. I want to read not all of this, but just little bits and pieces of it as we go. Page what now? Okay, we're on page 248 down there at the bottom where it says the need of a tempter. Satan fell without any external temptation, didn't he? Did he? He fell without any external temptation. No ambient temptation. No external temptation. He said, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And stars of God are what? Realizing. Here, stars are the are the sons of God, are the other angels. And I will set upon the mount of the congregation. The mount means what? Government. In the uttermost parts of the north, I will send above the heights of the clouds, and I will make myself like the most high. Isaiah 14, 13, 14. He sinned deliberately, didn't he? He spurned or spurred on by the un he was spurred on by the undue ambition. Undue ambition. There are many things that are vehicles of temptation. Satan's was his undue ambition. Yet he was very high, wasn't he? He was the most beautiful of all of the creations of God. He was a leader, and he was in the throne room. The first, the first Eden that was created by God, was Adam, or not Adam, but... Uh, uh, Hillel was put in it, Lucifer. He had a lot of leadership, didn't he? He had leadership qualities. He was a leader. By undue ambition, and as a result, he became what he is. He became Satan. Had man fallen without a tempter, he would have originated his own sin, wouldn't he? That's, that is a great big... This is in bright lights, okay? Had man fallen without a tempter he would have originated on sin and would have himself become like Satan and this also reveals God's benevolence his love in leaving a possibility for man's redemption and did not leave a possibility for Satan's or the fallen angels redemption did they the last week's message was the terrible infection of sin and this one is vehicles vehicles of temptation the possibility of resisting, resisting temptation do we have ability to resist temptation do we have it we do the spirit of God dwells in us and helps us to resist temptation and corrects us when we submit to temptation doesn't it beats us up he had as much power to choose to obey God as to choose to disobey him the mere possibility of sinning alone was never made has never made any man commit sin deliberate resistance would have caused Satan to flee maybe as it did in Matthew the fourth chapter and then let's look at another little statement how could so great a penalty be attached to such a small, slight command? Leave that tree alone. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. Really, now, I've heard preachers say that, that when 
uh, and we're going to go there. We're going to go there, and we're going to see what happened again. I mean, we can't go through Matt, uh, Matthew 4 or Genesis 3 enough. We can't do it enough. The principle involved. The great act to prove or disprove one's loyalty to another or to God. A sometimes a simple act is the best test of a spirit of obedience. It says here, if a child is compiled or complied with his mother's wishes in seeming obedience in many respects, and then persists in disappointing in some other matter, it's still a disobedient child in it. It re reveals the child's true character, which is a sinner by nature. We are what we might call crackpots, fragile vessels that have been placed and, and, and pieced back together with cement of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the importance of the command. Man's obedience was to be tested in the matter of property. This is not yours. It is mine. Which was an outward sensible sign of the right state of the heart toward God. That the command was significant from God's point of view is disclosed by the severity of the penalty announced for its disobedience. How else could Adam interpret the declaration that if he disobeyed, what? He would die. The penalty was announced beforehand, wasn't it? Was it? Now, today in society, I talked about a sociopathic society here a while back when I was in Fish Lake Valley. I talked about a sociopathic society. A society that has no conscience. A society that kills people. You know, we have all these killings in the schools. We have these people over there in the, in the Middle East that are capturing these uh, Christian children and gutting them and pulling out their hearts and livers and whatever, lungs, and selling them on the market. These organs. Because they have no respect of life. They have no boundaries. And their religion is bad religion, is it not? A bad religion, a sociopathic society. Oh, because of Adam's sin, we have a capability of a sociopathic society, don't we? Mm -hmm. If we sear our consciences, we're life and death doesn't matter, and we go out there, and one of the things in the Bible that is a dire what we might call prohibition, a prohibition. There's something that prohibits this horrible, these horrible acts of sociopathic society is executions. When you do something like this, when you go out and you kill 15 or 16 kids in the school, I don't care if that child is 16 years old, he has done an act that is so terrible according to the word of God that he must be executed because execution is a what is a deterrent to that type of crime so if they see this person being executed for what they have done then we will have a deterrent to that crime mm -hmm. but when you don't have any limits you have problems you have sociopathic society here in the garden, God announced to a perfect person that had a perfect person taken out of him that there were rules. Adam was not left in ignorance about the seriousness of this matter. In announcing the penalty, God made it clear that it was an issue of life and death. They didn't understand death yet. But they will. Disobedience would be considered a deadly sin. 
and it was choice between life and death, between God and self. And remember, sin is selfishness, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The condition revealed. Why did man yield to Satan's temptation? And I'm going to take objection to that. Man did not sin. Adam did not sin to Satan's temptation. He did not. Hit, he did not. Now let's go look and see what I'm saying. What I'm saying about here. Let's go find out what happened to Adam. Let's go back to third chapter of the book of Genesis, and we went to page 250 there. Let's go to Genesis three and find out what happened here. You tell me what happened, okay? What happened? What was the vehicle of temptation? Tell me what the vehicles of temptation were. That's your job. Yeah. Now let's go. We Nahash and the serpent became more evil, more corrupt, and crafty than any living thing, any living thing, any, el any other living thing, that's what it says in the, in the Hebrew, of the Hasadah, of the, of the field, of the pasture, which the Lord God had made, and he said to the woman, indeed has God said you shall not eat from, actually it says mikal in Hebrew, and it means from every tree of the garden, from every. And the woman said to the serpent, from the peri, from the fruit of the trees of the Hagan or the garden, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, and God put it in the middle of the garden, didn't it? God said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. That's it. Now let's look and see what happened. Yes, brother. Uh, quick question. Uh, no, so the, the snake is talking to the woman, but is it, I mean, I, we know that the donkey talked to Balaam also. Is it the yeah. same thing? Or no, Balaam? this was common back then. Animals communicated because they were companions, weren't they? This was not an unusual thing. But what we have here, we don't have the snake, the Nahash, talking to Eve, or actually her name was Isha at this time. It was not Eve yet. She has a different name later. Her name is Isha right now. He's talking to Isha, but the serpent is not talking to Isha. Because the serpent has loaned his body to the spirit of Satan as Judas did. Okay? So it's actually Satan talking through the vehicle of that person. When we have seances and stuff, people actually, at times, people actually are overpowered by a spirit that speaks through them and this spirit that was speaking through the serpent he had a vehicle of bringing temptation to this woman this was the vehicle of temptation the serpent was so they had the, the animal back then had the vocal capacity to evidently to evidently we don't see anything unusual about this right because we didn't see it like Balaam's having this argument with his donkey. Yeah, he had a conversation. He amazed, but he's not. Yeah. You know? Yeah. He, well, animals do communicate with you. You know that. Well, I the think. Way, the way we talk. Well, we like don't talk do. like this, but I guarantee right. you, your animal can tell you what they want. Right. Can't they? Can. they? They can communicate. They're communicating. But here they had the, the what we call the vehicle of speech. Evidently, this one did. And this may have been the king of all the beasts. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat from it or touch it lest you die. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. Don't go near it. And I've heard that Eve added to what God had said, but we don't know everything God said. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. It's mine. That was a prohibition. Now the serpent is a vehicle of temptation. But let's find out what the vehicle of temptation really was. 
And the serpent said to the woman, You shall surely not die. God is lying to you, first of all. God's lying. And serpent's lying. Satan's lying through the serpent, the vehicle of temptation. Vehicles of temptation. For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God's, knowing good and evil. Good and evil. Okay? You'll be like God's. So now what what vehicle of temptation has been set before the woman right now? Pride. Pride. Now the woman was tempted. Pride. Pride. And knowledge. And when the woman saw that the tree was what? Beautiful. Beautiful. Do women like pretty things? Now, women are terrestrial. Do you know what I'm talking about? What does a woman do? What have women done for thousands of years? <laughs> terrestrial. What does that mean? Bodies are bodies, isn't it? What? Isn't it our bodies or flesh? Terrestrial. What does women? What do women do? They gather, don't they? The they gather. They gather things in the bathroom? <laughs> well, every time you go to the bathroom, a group of them go together. Oh, okay. They gather stuff. <laughs> They're gatherers. All right. They gather and hoard things up for the winter. Women, food, things, clothing, all of this. They gather, don't they? This is what they do. This is some innate thing in a woman that she wants to do, isn't it? Now, among American Indian culture, women did all the work, all the gathering. The men did the hunting and the protecting. The women did the work, the gathering. And so now this woman, because of her natural instincts now, God is putting or not God, but Satan is putting out there that vehicle of temptation that will reach her. Okay? The vehicle of temptation that will affect her, that will most effectively cause her to sin. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, she was pretty, and it tasted good. And that it was a delight to the eyes. It was very, very pretty. And that the tree was desirable to make one wise. So look at all this pride, beauty, and stuff. And she took from its fruit. She kept on taking the from fruit. And she kept on eating it. Sharon, did I tell the truth? That's in the imperfect tense, isn't it? Well, wow, consecutive and perfect. And she kept on giving also to her husband with her. And he ate. Did Satan tempt man? No. no. Didn't he? He used, the woman. he used the woman as a vehicle of temptation. He used the woman as a, tempt a vehicle of temptation. He didn't tempt the man. The man knew better, didn't he? But now let's see what in the world happened to Adam. What is one of the greatest emotional powers in the world? In the history of the world with men? Love. Love. Do you think the man loved that woman? Do you think he did? Nations have been destroyed over love. Did you know that? Nations have been built because of love. Anthony and Cleopatra, Napoleon and Josephine, all of these different things we see. Herod and Heroditis. <laughs> we, we see all of this in history, don't we? We see Jacob and his wife that he loved. And it was greatly complicated, wasn't it? Yeah, Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> we see all of this. 
We saw all the history of love in the Bible. Vehicles of temptation. So now, Satan secondarily, if, he, if I can get that woman, I got him. If I can just get that woman, I've got him. Because he'll never turn her loose. He will not do it. He is sneaky. Sneaky, isn't he? Yeah. Vehicles of temptation. <clears throat> Let's go on. And she kept on giving to her husband, and he kept on eating. They just kept on eating, they kept on eating, they kept on eating. Like I've said in the past, maybe they ate the whole tree and then dug it up and ate the roots. I don't know. But it says they kept on eating. And the eyes of them were both opened, and they knew that they had become evil, wicked, corrupt, twisted, dishonest, thieves, robbers, liars, cheats, everything. And then they sowed fig leaves together and made for themselves britches. Basic. There was a Bible called the Britches Bible. They made for themselves britches. Why in the world would they do that? Why? Why? That which so tempted the mankind, oh, so tempted man, they knew they were naked in each other's eyes and they knew they were naked in God's eyes. So they made britches to cover themselves. And they heard the sound of Jehovah Elohim walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves, kept on hiding themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Now, we know that God is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipowerful, don't we? So did God know where he was or not? Oh, yes. yes. Did Adam need to know where he was? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the, in the garden, and I was afraid. I became afraid because I was a room. So I hid myself. A room, that means wicked, corrupt, naked, all of those things, because the serpent had become a room. And now he becomes a room. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And what did the man say? <laughs> it's your fault, God. It's your fault. It's your fault. God, it's your fault. We always blame somebody else for our sin, don't we? It's your fault, God. The vehicle of temptation was not from Satan. It was something that he touched. And that had become corrupt in our room. And mankind didn't want to walk off and leave her or touch her or love her in that state because he was holy, wasn't he? So what did he do? He became unholy so he could touch her. She was a vehicle of temptation. And the man said to the woman whom I gave to be with you, or the, 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 who you gave to be with me, she gave to me and I ate. She kept on giving to me and I kept on eating. Now, what was the vehicle of temptation? Satan directly tempted the woman, didn't he? And he secondarily, in a secondary way, used the woman to tempt the man. And that's the story of the world, isn't it? Is it not or is it? The story, the history of man. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that who you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. Was she deceived? Yes. yes. She was deceived. Now I'm glad she was deceived. 
And I'm glad it happened like this. Because the woman was not responsible for what she did because she was deceived. But the man was. And now to the infection of the blood of Adam, Adam, we have all of this infection, this terrible infection of sin that is born in every child that is born natural in this world. Only one was born without sin, and that's Jesus Christ our Lord. And we're going to look at his temptation and the vehicle of the temptation that Satan used to tempt directly. Adam was not directly tempted. I'm gar- I want you to understand that he was not directly tempted by Satan. Satan used the woman and his love for her. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle and more than every living beast of the field. And on your belly you shall walk, and in dust you shall eat all the days of your life, and I will put active hatred between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and you shall bruise him as to the head, but he shall bruise you as to the Jacob. 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 Jacob is what the word is. Jacob. Jacob. Jacob comes right from that. What does Jacob mean? To follow the heel. And you shall bruise him to the heel, you shall deal a death a deadly crippling blow to him but he shall kill you and a woman he said I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth now you know in 15 that's the first promise of the Messiah and the first knowledge that we have that angels are going to have babies Satan will at least have one because he will put active hatred between what? your seed and her seed between your seed Satan's seed and her seed Jesus Christ and to the woman he said I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth this is it a woman maybe could have had a child without pain at all I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. I will greatly multiply. Remember where the child comes from? Where it gets there? That was covered up with aprons, wasn't it? I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth, and in pain you shall bring forth children. And when the first time that a woman was with a man and probably several times, she's in great pain. That's part of the curse. Part of the curse. Your desire shall be to your husband in spite of the pain. In spite of the pain, your desire shall be for your husband to the one you love. I'm old enough to remember... And Brother Ray, you go back almost that far. When you got married, or when a woman had got pregnant, you didn't know whether you were going to live or not. Did you know that? It was dangerous. Good thing. Childbirth was dangerous. Marilyn's grandfather's first wife died right after childbirth. How many in your family have, in the old days, before modern medicine, how many died in complications of childbirth? In early America, men had four or five different wives. Both because they kept on dying in childbirth, or complications of childbirth. So now, in spite of all of this, she's going to desire her husband anyway. Your shall desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Now that's the hardest thing. That curse is really rough on women, isn't it? Huh? Some women more than others. You shall listen to him. 
He listened to you. Now you listen to him. Okay? He listened to you, and you blew it. Now you listen to him from now on. That's it. That's part of the curse. That's part of the curse. That, that's hard, isn't it? Vehicles of temptation. Is that a vehicle to temptation to women today? Not obeying their husbands? It's rough, isn't it? But your, your, your husband ought to make it where it's easy. It ought to be. You ought to make it where it's delightful to obey. Okay, all right. <laughs> then, the, at, at, then to Adam he said because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you not to eat you shall not eat from it cursed is the ground because of you We, I tell you what down there in Old River right now I've got every kind of weed this tall that you can think of horrible things stickers stinking nettles, all of this because of what Adam did here. It's still here, people. All of these rains, we think, and look at, oh, thank the Lord for the rains, and I look down there, and I, we got the weed capital of the world down there, people. <laughs> There's cockleburrs and stinging nettles, sand burrs, goat heads, foxtails, all of these terrible, noxious plants. And they're all around me. I'm surrounded. I went off to Nevada and I was thinking seriously about, you know, trying to keep that place there and trying to live up there most of the time but have a place to come back here, which we need some place to come to. And when those weeds started growing, I said, I'm changing my mind. <laughs> that curse is still real. Still there. Cursed is the ground because of you, and told you shall eat from it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it will grow because of you. But you shall eat the plants of the field, and by the sweat of your nose, literally, you shall keep on eating bread till you go to the ground. Because from it as you were taken, and to dust you shall go. Now the woman... Now the man called his name, he, he changed the name of his wife and he called her Eva, which means living. She's going to be the mother of all dying, but he's going to call her the mother of all living because he believes Genesis 3.15. Okay, now let's look at vehicles of temptation even more. Let's go to Matthew, Kadamathion, the fourth chapter. Now here, Adam was not tempted by Satan, was he? Was he or was he not? He used the vehicle of temptation, which was Isha, woman. Vehicles of temptation. Now let's look at our Savior and Lord and our God, okay? Why? But our God here now, he is the seed of the woman, isn't he? He's born without the infection of sin in him, isn't he? Does he have sin in him? Does he have the ability to sin? Does he have a choice? Yes. Yeah, he has a choice. And he's the perfect Adam. The first Adam was what? The one that gives us the sin nature, the infection of sin, the terrible infection of sin. And the second Adam is a spiritual life-giving element from the heavens. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Eremu, that is destitute wilderness. There's no food out there. There's lizards and snakes and horned toads and things like that, you know. That's all out there. Like you go out in the out back of Australian places. Nothing there. You have to learn to survive in that place. Now, in other places here, it says that he communed with the animals, the wild beast of the field out there when he went out into the desert. He communed with them. And uh, 
he was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted directly by the devil. Directly. Directly. You know what that means? That Satan was going to be the vehicle of temptation. Not the woman. Now, if you're a Mormon, he's already got married and he's already having kids. That didn't happen. He didn't marry Mary Magdalene and have kids. He didn't marry Martha and have kids. According to Mormonism, he married Mary and Martha and all of those girls. And that they were his wives. It's, it's interesting that Satan came down and did the job himself. He That's right. He wasn't anybody else. No. He didn't, wasn't, it wasn't to bother Jesus with a woman. He was beyond that. I mean, even a demon, even an evil spirit, he was going to go himself. Did he want himself? He didn't, he didn't use the snake. He didn't use the woman. Okay? He didn't use the snake that was familiar territory in that garden. And he didn't use the woman. But he goes directly. The vehicle of, of temptation here to Jesus is direct. And it's to the point. Let's find out how he was tempted. The vehicles of temptation. to be tempted by the devil. Now the devil wasn't there yet, right there, because he remained out there for 40 days. Mm -hmm. Now I'll tell you what, it's hard to fast for 40 days. People have died trying to do that. Do you know that? Yet for this type of fasting, for this period of time, it takes supernatural power. How long did Moshe fast? Come on. Sharon? 80 days. He went up there for 40 days and received the commandments of God, went down there, broke those commandments right in front of their eyes, and was sent back up there for another 40 days. So he was, he went out without eating 80 days. But he was sustained by God. Sustained by God. And here is the God that sustained him right here. Well, I'm going to tell you the God that sustained him was living in a human body. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he, he became extremely hungry. <clears throat> I don't know whether you've been real hungry or not. Have you ever been so hungry that your belly swelled up? Yeah. Have you ever been so hungry that your stomach gnawed on you and hurt? The acid in your stomach just ate, ate it up and hurt? I have. I was hungry like that when I was young. I was hungry. Hungry. I remember up in Fish Lake Valley when we moved up there, my mother, my poor mother, had never fended for herself in this world. Never had to. My grandmother took care of her and always bought all the food. And my grandmother was a gatherer, you know, naturally. She gathered up all kinds of food. She'd go get fruit and can it. And we didn't have facilities. She'd can fruit and put it in a jar and put wax on top of it and put a cloth over that and tie it down real good. Make sure it's sealed good. That's all we had. Candy marks, paraffin. She did everything she could to keep us food on the table so we wouldn't starve to death. We had food poisoning a lot because we had no refrigeration or anything. We'd come home with beans boiling from the heat, fermenting, and then had, she'd have to throw baking soda in that and boil those beans at least for 20 minutes until they were really boiling from heat and let them boil like that for 20 minutes because you might die from it otherwise and we had food poisoning at times too often I know what it means to be hungry but I didn't go without eating for 40 days when my grandmother got killed I weighed 165 pounds I was 6 foot tall when I graduated from school four years high school four years later, I was six foot two and weighed 139 pounds because I was starving all the time. Didn't have enough food to eat. Huh. 
hunger is a terrible thing. Terrible thing. Now let me tell you this also. No one in the world has ever starved to death because there's not enough food. People starve to death because of greed. Did you know that? Yep. There's enough food in this world to feed every human being on it. But there's people handling the food and distributing food with great wealth. And the tempter came and said to him, vehicle of temptation, vehicles of temptation, if, you're a, if you are really the Son of God. Now, what is wrong with that in the original language here? What's wrong with this translation? It says, since you are the Son of God. It didn't say if. That's the first last conditional particle in Greek. It says, since you are, did Satan know that he was the Son of God? Of course he did. He knows what he's doing. He's directly dealing with a pre, the pre-incarnate Jehovah walked in the garden, and now we have the carnate Jehovah here in flesh. The tempter came and said to him, Since you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread, food, manna, whatever. He could make it. Did he make manna? Did Jesus make manna in the wilderness? Did he bring all the, all the quail into the wilderness? Did he bring water out of a rock? He did it before. Why couldn't he do it now? Now, we know that naturally quail migrate across the Middle East. And they fly so high, and that's exactly how high they flew when they went into the camps of Israel in the wilderness but there aren't that many of them. God multiplied those quail. And they were large quail, a very large quail like a chucker. Big, big quail. And he stuffed those people with those quail. And some of those quail were created. The manna came into that land. You could go out there and get manna. But manna only came at certain times, but it came for 40 years constantly. That was a miracle. And so much of it out there in the wilderness. God created that. Jesus did it. And Jesus is the one that did that. Command these stones become food. Verse number four. Vehicles of temptation now. Was Jesus hungry? Was he hungry? Is that hunger a natural thing when you don't eat? Is there anything wrong with being hungry? Is it a sin to be hungry? But was he hungry? Did he... Let's find out what he did here. Did he succumb to turning the stones into food? And maybe breaking a rock and having water? He fasted. He didn't have any water. He didn't have any food for 40 days. But he is supernatural too, isn't he? Angels are sustaining him as God, Jesus, sustained Moshe up on the mountain. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, by food alone, but every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. And then we have another vehicle of temptation. Then the devil took him into, a, into the holy city, that was going to betray him and crucify him. Do you think Jesus knew this was going to happen? Yeah. He took him to the holy city and he stood him on the pinnacle of the temple and I don't know whether we've got anything like that here. No, we don't have it. You've been there, Sharon. Right up on the edge, here's where the temple area was and on this corner up here, on that corner, you can look down, they say it's over a thousand foot drop. 1,300 foot or something like that. He said, jump off. Jump off, Jesus. Jump off. Obey me. Obey me. Now, what part of vehicle of temptation would that be? What's the vehicle of temptation? Jump off. Pride. Throw yourself down. What? Pride. Pride. Did he tempt Eve with pride? 
What was Adam tempted with? Eve. That's it. Love. He was tempted with Eve. That's all. Isha, literally. For it's written, now Satan knows the Bible, doesn't he? He will give his angels charge concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And then Jesus answered him, On the other hand it is written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And what's he saying here? This is really cool. You shall not tempt me, the Lord your God. Don't tempt me. This isn't going to work. Don't tempt me. Number eight. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain. What's mountain mean? Government. Somewhere he took him up there, looking down of all the governments in the world and the powers of Satan that he saw. He saw all the powers of Satan. All of his government, all of his... Uh, uh, nation. Satan has a nation, doesn't he? High mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you'll fall down and worship me. Did Satan possess them? Could he have given them to him? Yeah. Was this a temptation? Mm -hmm. Now let's go back and look at Jesus at this time. Vehicles of temptation. First of all, Jesus had poured out all of his omnipotence when he became human flesh, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He never did one miracle from the body of Jesus. Not one. All was the power of the Holy Spirit. Was he hungry? Yes. Was he desperate for food? I think so. Was there any pride in Jesus that would tempt him? No. Didn't have that. Satan was looking at him because Satan is a supernatural being, isn't he? But was Satan proud? What else controls great men in the world are controlled by women and by what? Pride and power. And power power and that's this power was Jesus omnipotent here no he was not omnipotent here would he become omnipotent again yes but right here he was not he was not omnipotent he was not all powerful but Satan offered him a limited form of that power to possess in his hand right now that vehicle of temptation. It didn't work. He said, all of these things I'll give to you when he showed these things. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and bend the knee toward me. If you just bend down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I'm the one that you shall bow to one of these days. Right now, I am in a very fragile predicament. But he said, you shall worship me one of these days. You shall. And then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and kept on ministering to him. What a deal. What a story, isn't it? Vehicles of temptation. The next thing we're going to study about is the fall. But this was... Man needed a vehicle of temptation, or if he otherwise, he would have been like Satan. But yet, he chose that woman that he loved over his service to God. He chose her. He chose her. And he knowingly chose her. And because of that, we are infected with this terrible infection of sin. Are we not? 
It just runs in our veins, doesn't it? It's always there. It never goes away. Vehicles of temptation. Well, God has so graciously. Now let's read on John just a little further and let's see what happened was happening as after Jesus was tempted. And when he heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. What happened to John that had been preaching the gospel? He was arrested. Actually, he was put in protective custody by Herod because he knew his wife would kill him. Get the Sicarii or the Herodian guard or somebody to kill him. So he put him in protective custody. But he wasn't good enough because we know later on that she would kill him anyway. By what? The temptation of a woman. <laughs> Her daughter. A courtesan. The Bible says there is no one righteous, not even one. For all have sinned, all have gone astray and fallen short of the mark of the glory of God. For the mesos, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We all are constantly surrounded by these temptations of the world, aren't we? Constantly, constantly, constantly. But we have a Lord and Savior that saves us. Saves us. But God demonstrates His love toward us what was the temptation that Adam had? Love. That was his temptation. What does God show toward us? Love. For God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners and are still sinners, Christ died for us. For God so hated the world, What's it say? Love the world. That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Temptations. Temptations were necessary, weren't they? The necessity of temptation. And we live with these temptations all of our lives. In Matthew, Jesus said, If your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your right hand offends you, cut it off. What does he mean there? Don't look at it. Don't touch it. <laughs> Just like in the garden. Again, don't go around it. Don't look at it. Don't touch it. Leave it alone. It says also, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It also says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're all surrounded by these temptations. What do you do with them? How do they affect you? How do they affect you? What happens? You know they're there. You know they're there. With the temptation comes what? The escape route. Doesn't it? The escape route. The greatest thing in mankind is eternal life. The greatest the greatest fear Reality. We are, once we become born in this world, once we're born, we will live forever in one state and one place or the other, won't we? What are you going to do with Jesus? That's the difference between hell and heaven, isn't it? And what you do in this life as a child of God makes a difference of where you are in eternity in heaven doesn't it what you do 
Brother Vincent, what song do we have today? Uh, 479. 479. If you're out there someplace in this world, if you heard this message, you know what temptation is. You know that we're born into temptation. We have temptation all of our lives. But we have a way out. We have a way of payment of our sins and our shortcomings through Jesus Christ and Him only. You confess with your mouth that you believe that God created Himself and mankind through the woman, that He lived a perfect life, and He did not sin, even though all the vehicles of temptation were there directly on our second Adam that weren't in the first Adam. Yet He lived a perfect life for you and for me that we might have eternal life with Him instead of away from Him. Brother Richard. salvation so rich and free but it sure cost the Lord everything didn't it he went through all those vehicles of temptations that we don't have to go like that we I mean there's Christians in the world that are starving to death today they're starving them to death in places we see all this we don't we live so rich and free here now where we are don't we and we have people out there in the world that don't have any place to go to church. We have, And we have a church, don't we? We're so blessed in so many ways. And now, church, let's say hi to Marna and Dawn in Australia. Oh, Marna. Hi, hi, Marna and Dawn in Australia. And Nancy in Pennsylvania and Troy and, and uh, all the different ones all over. We're John in Australia and Marcielle and uh, the Philippines. And we're praying for all of you always. Father, we send this message out today to you. We send it out to these people that we love so much from all over the world. We ask you to bless them with your words and with your, with your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.